Well, good afternoon. Thank you for coming to this Caribbean semester presentation. Uh, appreciate the people who are here in Corley Auditorium and Webster Hall, and we have more people watching via Zoom. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Frederick H. Smith, who is an assistant professor and coordinator of the Global Studies Program in the Department of Liberal Studies at North Carolina A&T State University, which is the largest of the historically black colleges and universities in the United States. It is located in Greensboro, North Carolina. Since 1995, Dr. Smith has conducted historical, anthropological, and archeological research on the role of alcohol in the Caribbean, especially on the island of Barbados. He is the author of Caribbean Rum, A Social and Economic History, published by the University Press of Florida in 2005, and The Archaeology of Alcohol and Drinking, published by the University Press of Florida in 2008. Dr. Smith has also published numerous articles on Caribbean drinking practices that draw on archaeological, documentary, and ethnographic evidence. So now, please turn your attention to Dr. Smith, who is joining us live from Greensboro, North Carolina. Thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, thank you all very much for uh, an opportunity to share my research with you on Caribbean rum. Um, so the Caribbean, uh, for me, is part of a broader Atlantic system. Um, and what I've tried to do with my research is simply recognize the fact that um, the Caribbean can't be sort of seen in isolation, but um, is uh, very much connected to North America, South America, Europe, and Africa in terms of trade. And it's been that way for, um, uh, 500 years. And so even thinking about places like New Orleans, um, which was settled largely by uh, French planters who brought their enslaved workers from Haiti after the Haitian Revolution, or the fact that Cuba is, um, uh, was the focus of the Spanish-American War and that we received much of our, or almost all of our sugar from Cuba up until 1959. And uh, after that date turned to corn sweeteners. So the fact that the Caribbean is part of this sort of broader Atlantic system is um, sort of the focus of my political economic research. And I've been working in the Caribbean region now for uh, close to 30 years. And so just to give you a broad overview of um, what I've been doing, and I've been in academic life for a long time, but uh, took off a couple of years to work for the government of Barbados to develop their uh, cultural heritage um, guidelines. Uh, I'm very interested in, in the African diaspora, the history of slavery and plantation life, and Barbados, which is a developing country, uh, is very much dependent upon tourism. But it has a very rich history. Uh, it was the start of the sugar industry in the British colonies in the Americas, which made uh, um, the wealth um, generated by sugar production uh, really helped to spark the industrial revolutions in Europe. And this is a, an argument that the famous uh, historian and prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Eric Williams, wrote in his book, Capitalism and Slavery, that if it wasn't for the development of sugar colonies in the Caribbean, that it never would have sparked the industrial revolution in Europe, which led to a great deal of wealth and a great deal of change. And so much of my work is aimed at uh, working with the government of Barbados, working with the government of St. Lucia as well, uh, nearby island in the um, Lesser Antilles, also a former British colony, but also a former French colony, uh, 
And our goals and efforts have been to protect and preserve and celebrate uh, cultural heritage in a way that is, uh, speaks to the needs of the local communities. Um, so when a hotel developer, when Hilton or Hyatt uh, wants to build a hotel, um, we need to make sure that they're not gonna damage any uh, heritage resources. And so one of the big problems is, is that much of the history of slavery is um, disappearing in this modern landscape of hotels and tourism. And so our efforts have been aimed at protecting sites associated with enslaved peoples, sites associated with uh, the indigenous peoples of Barbados who were there for thousands of years before the arrival of Europeans, um, looking at the religious history of the island, the history of Jews, um, of the Baptist church, of Methodist church, uh, but also sites associated with um, African descended uh, spirituality. So I'm also director of, uh, in addition to being a professor, uh, director of history and archeology span at St. Nicholas Abbey Sugar Plantation, which if you've ever gone to Barbados, it's the premier heritage site on the island. It's the oldest uh, sugar plantation on the island. And um, it's a symbol of sort of the emergence of the modern world of the broader political economic trade. Um, when you think about uh, early English colonization, I actually live in uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, right next to Jamestown, which was the first permanent English settlement. But those early colonists really struggled. They grew a little bit of tobacco, which helped to, to support the settlements. But it wasn't until the sugar industries um, in the Caribbean, in Barbados, later on in Jamaica, um, that you begin to see an incredible amount of wealth. It was a revolution um, in terms of economic development, in terms of demographics, in terms of politics. And uh, so the Caribbean is, um, and so the work that I've been doing at St. Nicholas Abbey uh, is really trying to highlight um, the role of enslaved laborers on the estate and the work that they did, uh, but also the tenant farmers in the post-emancipation period, um, looking at the African diaspora in much the same way that if you go to Monticello in Charlottesville, Virginia, or if you go to Mount Vernon in Alexandria, Virginia, that you, you see a history of elites. And that's been the history of the Caribbean as well, that the, the elite history is tended to um, be highlighted and often uh, overlooking the role of everyday people, enslaved laborers, uh, freed men and women of color, uh, women in general, and the poor classes of whites that work on Caribbean plantations. So our efforts have really been aimed at working with this uh, private property owner to to sort of center um, people who've been left out of traditional histories. And so part of that effort includes uh, a program that I've run for many years as a study abroad at different universities, uh, University of Florida when I was there, Western Michigan University for a few years when I was there, College of William and Mary, and bringing students to do archeological research and to identify what we can from the archaeological record because enslaved peoples, uh, native indigenous peoples, poor classes did not leave uh, documentary records. So oftentimes it's only the archaeological evidence that we find um, that really gives us some insights into the lives and the day-to-day -day lives of ordinary peoples in the Caribbean. And this is uh, one of the most important sort of things that we do is protecting and preserving um, historical structures. Now, this is one of the last remaining slave huts, what they called slave huts in Barbados. This dates to the 18th century. 
Um, it's obviously got a modern roof on it, but these were um, the houses uh, for enslaved peoples who worked on plantations in the Caribbean and Barbados. And by doing this research, we are helping to ensure uh, we're recording information about the sites, but we're also advocating for the protection of these sites so that they don't get destroyed when somebody wants to build a golf course. And let's see. And a lot of this is also about bringing together students from the United States and the Caribbean to work together in ways that are aimed at developing a heritage so that um, there's an educational component to it. In a British colony, former British colony like Barbados, um, it, the, the children in school still learn the kings and queens of England and they don't really get a sense of the African past, even though 90% of the population are descendants of enslaved peoples, enslaved Africans who were brought over during the 17th and 18th centuries. And so, um, and it's very important also for the fact that there are many uh, Barbadians, for example, who live in New York, who live in Toronto, who live in London. And when their children and grandchildren come back to the island, we want them to be able to see um, the places where their ancestors lived, um, where they socialized, and not just simply see lots of nice fancy hotels and white sand beaches, which is what most people go to Barbados to see. And so there's a strong educational component uh, working with local school teachers. And um, as I say, training, um, there's a heritage tourism component to it as well. One of the projects I worked on was the George Washington House. Uh, George Washington uh, went to Barbados and was a young man, 19 years old. Uh, he spent seven weeks there. It was the only place that George Washington ever traveled outside the United States. He went there because his brother was ill. Um, uh, while Washington was there, he himself uh, contracted smallpox which many Barbadians say uh, helped prevent him from catching smallpox, uh, which decimated the soldiers during the American Revolution. So um, our efforts have a, a tourism component as well because it brings in money to this developing uh, island nation. And so, as I said, most of my research has been focused on the African diaspora and I'm particularly particularly interested in the transfer of West African cultural traditions to the Americas. So what survived the violence in the Middle Passage? What cultural aspects of Africa are there? And this, for example, many of you may recognize as a cowrie shell. This was actually found on um, an archeological site uh, of a slave village up at St. Nicholas Abbey. And these were worn as um, uh, necklaces. They were braided into hair. Uh, they were worn as necklaces, anklets, bracelets. And it's one of the few things that enslaved peoples were able to bring with them um, across the Atlantic. So the fact that you find this little cowrie shell opens up an opportunity for discussions about the transfer of West African traditions, about adornment. Um, these were also used for games and they were also used um, as sort of a form of currency. And so to find this little cowrie shell opens up uh, a larger story about the transfer of West African cultural traditions. One of, uh, one of the other things and one of my favorite discoveries up at St. Nicholas Abbey are these little um, ceramic discs. And if you look at them, they're broken pieces of pottery. Now, if you live in a small island and you're dependent upon um, goods coming in from overseas, nothing goes to waste. Uh, the Caribbean is a, uh, we live in a modern society where everything is disposable, but in the 17th and 18th century, uh, centuries you, relied on the few ships that were coming in every year for whatever goods you could find. 
And so when a plate or a teacup or something broke on the plantation, it wasn't simply thrown away, but it was often recycled and reused and repurposed for other, um, for other things. And these little ceramic discs were made from broken pieces of pottery, and they were probably used um, by enslaved peoples at St. Nicholas Abbey for a West African game, which was very uh, popular in uh, the Akan societies of what is today Ghana and the Igbo societies of what is today Nigeria. Uh, and the game was called Wari uh, and it's often also referred to as Mancala. And so looking for, you know, you know, a lot of this goes back to debates in the late 19th century by W.E.B. Du Bois and Carter Woodson who argued that Africa was often left out um, and disparaged in sort of the Jim Crow um, society of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, which argued that there was nothing of Africa uh, that survived the Middle Passage. But in fact, if you look at the archaeological record, you can find that a great deal of cultural traditions from adornment to gaming practices did in fact survive and take hold and take root and the societies of the Caribbean and the societies of North America and South America within the African diaspora. And it really shows the adaptability because you had enslaved peoples coming from not just one particular ethnic group, but from multiple ethnic groups who had different traditions. So um, the Congo, if you go to Brazil today, the majority of peoples are, are uh, Congolese descent um, from the Congo Angola region. If you look at North America, the majority of enslaved peoples came from the Igbo uh, speaking peoples of Nigeria. If you go to Jamaica, it also has a great deal of Igbo influence. In Barbados, there tends to be more of an Akan, Ashanti influence culturally, and that's simply a result of when the slave trade uh, began in Barbados, which began earlier. And if you go to Cuba, you'll see a great deal more of Yoruba influence in terms of cultural traditions. Now, for example, voodoo in Haiti is very much influenced by the Aja Fon speaking peoples from what is today Benin, but it also incorporates traditions from the Congo and from the, and from Nigeria and from different um, ethnic groups that ended up in uh, the slave trade. And so this really highlights the adaptability of culture, the, um, but more importantly, the creolization, the birth of an entirely new African-American culture, um, which is based on a variety of different African ethnic groups, but also um, Europeans, as well as Native American peoples. Now, North Carolina, where I am right now, um, the Cherokee uh, peoples uh, were very strong here, and most people can trace their ancestry back, um, not just uh, to African descent, but also to Native American descent uh, through the Cherokee. And so it really, it really highlights the sort of hybridity and development of an entirely new culture based on uh, a variety of different ethnic groups. Now, one of the things that I wanted to focus on and that I was interested in and that nobody had looked at before was the drinking practices of enslaved peoples and how they transferred from West Africa to the Caribbean and um, really trying to highlight the social and spiritual aspects of alcohol within those societies and alcohol was widespread in the Caribbean, and you, rum in particular. Uh, and if you ask anybody today, uh, you know, from the Caribbean, in many ways, it's a defining aspect of Caribbean culture. Uh, there was a song, popular song in the 1920s or 30s uh, called Rum and Coca-Cola, which was remade by the Andrews sisters. Um, 
uh, sort of between the wars. And the song is really about the mixing of American and Caribbean cultures, rum representing Caribbean cultures and Coca-Cola representing the United States. And so again, it's this sort of blending of cultural traditions, but it's also highlighting and um, recognizing the fact that rum is very much tied up with identity. So if you ask somebody from the Caribbean what their favorite rum is, the answer will always be whatever rum is made on that particular island so or country. So if you ask a Haitian, they'll tell you that Barbancourt is the best rum in the world. Jamaicans will always tell you that Appleton is the best rum. Um, and Barbadians will tell you that Mount Gay is the best rum. And this has to do with the fact that rum is so much tied up with national identity and you are what you drink. This is why um, people throughout the world drink Budweiser beer because it's associated with Americanness uh, and in our modern sort of global system, uh, global economic system and through globalization is become synonymous with, um, with identity. In the same way that on St. Patrick's Day, we all drink green beer, uh, not that the Irish drink green beer, but that we associate with beer drinking and green with the Irish. So, so I'm very much interested in identity and also interested in the transfer of West African cultural traditions. And so Barbados uh, was settled by the English in 1627. The first crops they produced were tobacco, which didn't do very well. Um, and they started to grow cotton um, and they experimented with indigo. And so for the first 10 or 20 years, most of the labor was done by indentured laborers, mostly Irish, Welsh, who had uh, sold their indentures for three to five years. Um, and tobacco was uh, an important product, an important commodity, but they couldn't compete with the tobacco producers in the Chesapeake regions of Virginia and North Carolina. And so as a result, the island uh, struggled economically. And those first English settlers came from societies in England where alcohol was very important, where they drank beers and they drank ale for social purposes, but also for nutritional purposes. One of the interesting things about alcohol is it's often safer to drink than uh, the local waters. So um, in England, in Europe, uh, you see beer consumption very much associated with health. I mean, we still associate alcohol with health. If you look at most of the medicines today for cough syrups and things like that, alcohol is a primary component. And alcohol, beer, making beer actually kills the microbes, the alcohol, the ethanol itself, and makes for a safer uh, drink than water in many cases. The interesting thing here is that the Europeans, the English that got to Barbados, didn't know uh, um, what to, how to produce alcohol from the local resources, and they relied on the native peoples. And this image is of Carib Indians um, who are making a drink called Wiku, and it was made from the root of the cassava plant. And you can see in the lower corner that this is produced by women. And these women would chew the um, cassava and they would spit it into a large pot. It would be boiled. It would be put into these containers known as conneries, where after about 14 days, it would ferment into a fairly strong beer. And this is a, a Carib Indian drinking festival. Um, and you can see that it's the men that are drinking so you can see the sort of sexual division of labor, the sexual div uh, divisions within Carib Indian society. And here they are in the back celebrating one of their monthly um, uh, celebrations, which were actually known as Wikus. They were drinking festivals and they would occur on a pretty regular basis. The interesting thing is that uh, once Europeans arrived, they introduced alcoholic beverages such as beer and wine into native Caribbean uh, societies. Uh, 
which really undermine the symbolic and social capital of women within these societies because this drink was not only important for social reasons, but it was also important for spiritual reasons, for making connections between the physical and the spiritual worlds. And so by introducing European drinks, this undermined uh, the production of local drinks, which were done by women. And it's really interesting to see how simply changes, small changes in one part of the system can affect the entire social structure of a society. So the interesting thing um, about that is that Europeans tried these uh, locally made alcoholic drinks. Um, they experimented with everything. The English fermented pineapples, they fermented grapefruit, they per fermented um, bananas, plantains, anything they could because um, they wanted alcohol. Uh, and in part, alcohol, rum or alcohol made from these uh, different fermented drinks, sort of was a way to cope with the challenges of life in early Barbados. So in the 1640s, the Dutch who had been in Brazil had been kicked out by the Portuguese. They had conquered a northern part of Brazil in the 1630s and they had established sugar industries, but the um, Portuguese eventually ousted the Dutch and the Dutch were looking for a place to reestablish their sugar industries and they settled in Barbados. They brought with them the knowledge, the capital, the technology, and a large number of enslaved workers to work on sugar estates. And you can see here um, uh, sugar cane. So this transformed Barbados. Barbados was a small colony, a few thousand English settlers, um, but sugar had transformed Barbados, not just economically, but also environmentally uh, in what was called the Great Burning. All of a sudden, uh, all the inland areas of the island were set ablaze um, so that planters could start establishing sugar plantations. It had a demographic impact as well because the labor system from indentured servants who made up the bulk of the labor force switched to uh, enslaved Africans. And that has to do with the nature of sugar production. But it's interesting that, that sugar, um, and the reason why I focus on Barbados is because Barbados was really the birthplace of rum making. Sugar planters were very efficient people, just like any farmers are today. You don't let anything go to waste. So once you were done grinding the sugar cane, and you'll see here in the background is a, um, is a mill wall. This would have had um, a windmill on top of it. And right next to it is a smokestack. So when planters in the 19th or late 18th century switched to steam power, they got rid of their windmills and started using steam engines. And you can, it's a nice little contrast there showing the evolution of the sugar industry. But what's interesting is that in the 1640s, that distilling was also starting to emerge as, a, um, as an industry that um, was coming out of the shadows. Um, physicians knew how to distill. It was, distilling was done for perfumes. It was done for medicinal reasons. The brandy industry was starting to sort of take off and brandy is distilled wine. Um, but most Europeans were still drinking beers and ales. Liquor, spirits were not uh, a common part of European societies or any societies in the world. Um, it's interesting that, that distilling is actually emerges in the Middle East. If you think the word for a, dis for a still, the word is alembec, right? Alembec, right? It's an Arab word. In the same way that alcohol, al cool, uh, is also uh, from the Middle East. And so the, the technology transferred from the Middle East to Europe, 
for medicinal reasons, and eventually ends up in the Caribbean when planters realize that they have um, uh, a lot of leftover material after the sugar industry, after sugar production, uh, and that material was molasses, and molasses, which has a high sugar content, can be distilled um, into alcohol. And so in the early days of alcohol production, um, and just, just to show you, um, all of a sudden, uh, with the shift to sugarcane, you see a shift in demographics as well. Um, sugar is an intensive uh, labor crop. So not only is it uh, planted and cultivated, but it also has to go through a process, a semi-industrial process uh, of squeezing the sugar cane. Because once sugar cane is cut, within about 24 or 48 hours, it will begin to go sour. So you have to squeeze it of its juice. And this is a windmill. This is an image from Antigua, I believe, um, where the sugar cane is being brought in uh, by mule carts. It's being squeezed in these rollers um, in the windmill. And that sugarcane juice runs down into a factory uh, where it is boiled to a, to a particular viscosity. And then it is poured into molds, um, leaving behind what is known as a sugar loaf. Um, and all the molasses uh, is draining out of the bottom and being captured in separate jars. So it's a, it's a semi-industrial process. So unlike wheat, or tobacco or rice, sugarcane and sugar um, uh, production requires this semi-industrial uh, activity. So this is why you needed larger numbers of laborers because you had not just the um, cultivation, not just the harvesting, but also um, the processing of sugarcane juice um, and so that's why you see large numbers of enslaved workers being brought over to Brazil. Uh, the majority of enslaved peoples of the 12 million peoples uh, from Africa brought to the Americas between um, uh, the early 16th century and the middle of the 19th century. Uh, the majority of them ended up in Brazil, which had uh, about 5 million of them. Um, to work on sugar plantations. And because Brazil was a major sugar producer at the time. So, so sugar already has this semi-industrial process, uh, which again, has this demographic impact on Barbados and leads to the rise of uh, African slavery um, in the island. And it's almost overnight with the introduction of sugar, um, the population of Barbados uh, goes from predominantly white to predominantly black um, and indentured servitude. Uh, the cost of indentured servants is increasing so much that uh, African slaves become the source of labor in the Caribbean. And so um, the first sugar mill is, or the first distillery is actually identified in Barbados in 1647. Um, it was a small, this is an image of a plan of a sugar factory. And you can see up here in the upper left-hand corner are what was the still house. And there's two small stills, maybe making a few hundred gallons a week. Um, and that this was largely used on the plantation um, for as sort of a source of cheap calories for enslaved workers. Uh, for indentured servants, and for um, the many uh, seamen uh, and mariners and ships captains that would come to Barbados. Those ships left Europe loaded with brandy and beer, again, because the sailors uh, recognized the salubriousness, the medicinal aspects, the health aspects of drinking um, alcohol, especially on these long sea voyages. Um, and so 
they would return uh, on a return voyage loaded with rum. So rum sort of enters the, the sort of European market through these um, uh, ships, through these sailors. And it's also very interesting the way that uh, the military plays an important role in the history of the distribution of rum. The daiquiri, for example, which is a popular American rum-based drink, actually was first made uh, in the town of Daiquiri in Cuba, and it was brought to the United States by um, American soldiers who were fighting in Cuba during the Spanish-American War. But early stills were very small and they were simple. And here's an image from Martinique, and this little arrow points to the small still that was used on the sugar factory in Martinique. Um, but by the 18th century, distilling becomes, uh, rum becomes part of the sort of Atlantic uh, economic system. Um, the American Revolution, for example, you begin to see distilleries popping up in Boston and Connecticut, New York, that are buying cheap molasses from French Caribbean planters, uh, and British Parliament didn't like that and in 1733 imposed the Molasses Act, which was one of the sparks of the American Revolution. And so rum is very much tied to this broader Atlantic economic system. And as planters um, recognized the value of rum, they started making more and more rum. And it usually, it was never as valuable as sugar, but it did bring in about 10 to 15% of plantation revenues. And if anybody comes from a farming background, farming family, you know that you don't let anything go to waste. So the, the canes that had been spent of their juice, they were used to fire the boilers that would boil the sugar cane uh, juice. The juice would be put into molds. The molasses would drip out from the bottom of those molds, would be put into a dis uh, a distillery into the distillery where it would be turned into a valuable economic commodity. So nothing went to waste. And the reason why the French were selling all of their molasses to uh, distillers in Boston and other parts of New England was because the French had banned the importation of rum from Haiti, from Martinique and Guadeloupe. Uh, to protect their own brandy industries. So all of a sudden, the, the French colonies had a lot of sugar, but they couldn't do anything with their molasses. They would produce some of it for local consumption, but they never had a home market for rum because it was a protected market for brandy. The Americans didn't have uh, a protected market. The English didn't have a protected market. So a lot of the rum ends up um, that's not being consumed on the plantations, being consumed in um, seaport towns in London and uh, Bristol or in New England. And so you also begin to see technological changes. Those small stills from the 17th century give way to what are known as gooseneck uh, stills in the 18th century, which are producing thousands of gallons of rum per week. And so there's technological innovations that are going along with uh, the increasing value of rum. So here's an image of Bridgetown, Barbados, and you can see hundreds of ships were coming there every year, turning Bridgetown into the wealthiest um, English colony in the 17th century. Uh, we all sort of have an American focus in our educational system and our history classes, which tell us uh, a very Americentric view of, of the world. But in fact, in the 17th uh, century and 18th centuries, uh, Barbados um, was a bustling uh, uh, seaport, uh, drawing hundreds of ships a year, producing a valuable economic commodity, sugar, as well as rum, as well as molasses. And it's interesting to think also when we think about Haiti today, um, and people think about Haiti and they think um, about uh, economic development, political instability, but in the 1780s, 1790s, 
Haiti, a French colony known as Saint-Domingue, produced half of the world's sugar and three quarters of the world's coffee. And so think about how valuable, it was so valuable to the French that after the Seven Years' War, 1763, um, the British gave the French the option of keeping French Canada or keeping their colonies in the Caribbean. And so the French had no second thoughts and they gave away French Canada and held on to Saint-Domingue, they held on to Martinique and Guadeloupe. And that's why today, if you look at Quebec and Montreal, uh, they were uh, basically gifted to um, the British uh, Canada after the uh, Seven Years' War. So, and rum was traded, uh, there were no distilleries in the U.S. South. There was one small distillery in Charleston, South Carolina, but it was used to, um, uh, for enslaved workers in North Carolina and South Carolina. It was traded to Native Americans um, in uh, New England as a way to stimulate the, the skins trade and the fur trade. Um, and one of the interesting things for me is the fact that you can't look at this country anywhere and not see the impact or the evidence for slavery. And I just stir this image in here because it's an image of Paul Revere. And the image of Paul Revere is not as important as the table that Paul Revere is sitting at. And this is a mahogany table. And these mahogany tables were produced for mahogany that was cut down in the Guyanas, cut down in other parts of the Caribbean, and turned into furniture um, uh, by enslaved workers um, as part of this sort of uh, trade, uh, global sort of trade that is beginning uh, during this time. And so it's just fascinating to think that all around us is the evidence for uh, the history of slavery, and you just have to look for it. Now, I was doing research in, on plantation uh, um, account books, and every plantation had an account book which listed the names of every single enslaved worker on those plantations. And this is a sample copy of one of those pages. Again, we don't have documentary evidence from enslaved peoples themselves, but we do have information about enslaved workers on particular estates. This would list the number of slaves, their particular name in this column, their age, whether they were Creole, and Creole means that they were simply born in Barbados, but some of them were from the Congo. Here's an individual from the Congo. Here is a Coromante, and a Coromante were basically the, the Akan peoples. Here, down here is an Igbo, and the Igbo speaking peoples of Nigeria. This next column would tell you what kind of work they did. And on sugar plantations, uh, the majority of workers were um, engaged in the fields, but there were a lot of skilled positions as well, including masons and cooks and boilers and watchmen and drivers um, and coopers, because again, sugar was this semi-industrial uh, commodity. Now, this last column here is what got me because it tells you different things about the aspects of, of the enslaved individuals themselves like, and how they work and their work ethics and their health issues. And one individual named Thomas who was 37 and he was a cook and it lists that he drinks as much as ever. Now, he was the only, there was only one other individual who was identified for their drinking. So if you were to start to think, was alcoholism common among enslaved peoples? Well, out of 450 some odd enslaved workers on this particular estate, uh, there were only two who were identified as uh, drinking heavily. Um, but you begin to look for evidence of the role of alcohol within enslaved communities. This is a runaway slave ad from Virginia, and it is uh, from Albemarle County, and it talks about an individual named Sandy 
who is greatly addicted to drink and when drunk is insolent and disorderly. Now, hold on. Ah. Oh my God, a bunch of my time. Um, and this is actually, if you look down at the bottom, a runaway slave ad posted by Thomas Jefferson. So I began working archeologically at Maps Cave in Barbados, where we found um, a very large cave that in the 17th century was sort of located in an isolated part of the island. And we know that there were runaway slave communities, there were maroon communities um, that escaped the plantations. And here's an image of enslaved peoples being chased by um, uh, an Englishman who was trying to get them back into the uh, plantations. But what's interesting is that the cave had a lot of Amerindian materials that runaways were using um, to sort of recycling the Amerindian materials in order to um, uh, survive their, their flight. But we also found that in the 18th century, a lot of 18th century material was um, also present. And by the 18th century, this, this cave had basically been incorporated into the larger plantation context. And so what is all this material doing here? It obviously couldn't have been used as a place for, um, for runaways and for maroon communities to develop. Um, and so what was the function or the purpose of this cave? Because it had been modified, there was a wall. This is the wall that was built in front of the cave. There was a wall, retaining wall built inside of the cave. There was a hole cut in the roof. And we found a lot of alcohol related materials, especially uh, glass bottles and stoneware drinking mugs. These date from the late 18th and early 19th centuries. We also found a lot of these ceramic bowls known as conneries. And these bowls were made by enslaved workers, by enslaved potters on estates in the Caribbean, in Barbados. And they are identical to pots that were used in West Africa, in Nigeria, in what is today Ghana, and what is today Nigeria, for the production of palm wine. Now, what were the social and symbolic meanings that enslaved peoples in Barbados attached to alcohol? In order to understand this, you have to go to the departure points for enslaved peoples. And in Barbados, it was mostly from what is today Ghana, which at the time was known as the Gold Coast, and the Bight of Biafra um, and Nigeria, where most of the Igbo speaking peoples came from. And those societies had a long tradition of alcohol use. They would tap palm trees um, and collect the sap and turn that into a, a popular drink, which is still popular in various West African societies today known as palm wine. And it was used in birth, marriage, naming, and funeral ceremonies. And alcohol was not simply for drinking, for social purposes, but alcohol opened lines of communication between the physical and the spiritual worlds. And you find that today, for example, in Haitian voodoo, or Cuban Santeria, or Obia in Jamaica, where people will pour libations um, for the ancestors, for the gods, for the Orishas, um, whether it be Ogun or Mamawata or the various Orishas that, um, that come from these uh, different areas of West Africa. It was a way of opening lines of communication and appeasing the spirits, appeasing the ancestors in much the same way that even today, when you open up a bottle of uh, of alcohol in the Caribbean, you always pour out the first few drops on the ground for the ancestors who came before us. And this is a pra practice that's also popular uh, in the United States. Rum was an important part of that trade. And the rum trade uh, is something that, again, connected this broader Atlantic network. 
And so, but planters were ambivalent about rum and they gave out huge amounts of rum to the enslaved workers on their estates for medicinal purposes, for calories, uh, and as part of a rewards and incentives system. But they also feared um, uh, that it was a source of rebellion, but it was also a way to sort of placate enslaved workers and keep them working. And so it was this, there's always these sort of tensions within society that you can see through the lens of, of rum. Women in particular uh, played an important role in the rum trade. Women tended to drink less and therefore would bring bottles of rum to the markets in town and sell them for various other goods. And one very famous individual was Rachel Pringle, who was born a slave, but was actually able to uh, gain her freedom. And she became one of the most popular tavern owners in, um, Barbada in Bridgetown, Barbados in the, 17th century, in the 18th century. And she is uh, a national hero. Um, and there's a statue to, going up to her in Hero Square. And again, it shows the opportunities for mobility within the slave uh, communities, within um, the freed community, and alcohol often provided those opportunities. This is an image from Jamaica of a funeral where you see the transfer. When, when somebody dies, they're not just simply buried, but they're marched through the community. And here, this young man has a bottle in his hand, probably a bottle of rum, which was used as sort of a grave good, something to bring to the afterlife, and a way to ensure that the ancestors and the spirits are not going to cause more trouble, and that you're going to have an easy entrance into the um, uh, afterlife. On plantations in South Carolina, on plantations in uh, the Caribbean, alcohol was widely used um, for celebrations. And this is an image of John Canoe, which is basically a Christmas time, a creolized sort of Christmas celebration in Jamaica. And so what was all this alcohol doing in Maps Cave and all these alcohol related artifacts? Well, in 1816, Barbados um, experienced the largest slave revolt in Barbados's history. Um, and it occurred and began on the plantation where this cave was located. And so what I argue is that alcohol provided a, a temporary timeout. It allowed people to speak like gods. It allowed for the formation of communities from various enslaved peoples um, from surrounding sugar plantations to go and drink and to foment revolutionary thought. It was an underground sanctuary. And so much like taverns in Boston prior to the American Revolution or cafes in Paris prior to the French Revolution, this cave, Maps Cave in Barbados, provided uh, a parliament of the people which led to the 1816 revolt. And that's where I am with rum. And if there's time, and I'm sorry, I kind of went a little over, but I can answer questions if anybody has any. There are people leaving. Yes. What's the best rum? Is that what you're asking? Hold on. Yeah, what is the best rum in the world? Since you so that. that. How do you spell that? <laughs> so <laughs> here's my chart of <laughs> the best rums in the Caribbean. Um, so it depends. Who you ask, but as somebody who works in Barbados, um, my heart and my soul are Barbadian, even though I wasn't born in Barbados, I've spent many years there. So I'm gonna tell you that the best rum in the world is Mount Gay rum. Uh, and that's because um, uh, I 
It is part of my identity, part of being Barbadian is drinking Mount Gay. But honestly, some of the best rums in the world now are coming from uh, Nicaragua and Guatemala. So it's interesting how the rum industry has evolved and moved from Barbados to Jamaica, Barbancourt in Haiti. Uh, Haitian rum is a very nice rum. Uh, but Zacapa and Florida Cana, the Spanish countries, the Spanish um, have really, uh, Latin American, Central American rum industries have really come a long way in the last 10 or 20 years. Is, just as a follow-up to that, are there, is there any particular country where rum makes up just a disproportionately large amount of their exports and their income? And that's an excellent question because um, Bacardi, uh, is one of the fifth most wealthy, uh, largest beverage producers in the world. But it, again, Bacardi began in Cuba and during the Cuban revolution was forced to flee to Puerto Rico. And they reestablished their distilleries in Puerto Rico. And if you, um, you wonder, I mean, you can't go to a bar in Missouri or North Carolina and not find a bottle of Bacardi rum. In part, that was part of a 1980s Reagan administration initiative to bolster um, the spread of communism uh, after the Cuban revolution by bolstering the rum industries in the Caribbean. And so Bacardi was a big benefit, benefactor of that. But I don't think, I can't think of any country where, because tourism is so important um, in the Caribbean that it pretty much nowadays, the sugar industries are dying um, throughout the Caribbean as corn sweeteners. Um, corn syrup has replaced sugar, sugar cane sugar. So um, uh, Bermuda uh, even makes rum. So, and, I, I think technically rum has to be made in the Caribbean, um, but there's a place in North Carolina that I discovered makes its own rum too. So uh, everybody's going into the distilling industry. I can't tell you how many of my former students have decided to open up uh, breweries and uh, distilleries. So is there another question? Thank you very much, Dr. Smith, for a fine presentation on Caribbean rum and a little bit of history. Well, well, thank you, and I hope uh, I hope you all enjoyed it, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share that uh, my research with you.